in the Amazon, far below the rainforest canopy, a network of roots stabilizes a thick tree trunk. Mirroring the branches and twigs among the leaves above, the roots below split into smaller roots, which split into yet smaller roots, extending outward to absorb water. All of that water gets stored in the tree's cells. A few miles away, a mighty river rushes. That river carries watercraft and fish, a few large and many small, inexorably toward a delta. What feeds the great river are smaller rivers, Apurimac and Montaro, then tributaries, which are fed by streams, which are fed by brooks, which are fed by sources high in the Peruvian Andes. Navigating the river early in the morning, an old woman goes fishing. Her body contains a system of veins and arteries that carry blood, enriched or depleted, to nourish every cell in her body. Likewise, her brain and limbs are animated by information signals within a network of nerves. These signals have to be processed by an organ of fractal complexity, or the old woman would be unable to navigate, much less fish. Everywhere in the world, we see these sorts of living systems. They display the property researchers Adrian Bejan and Sylvie Laurent refer to as few large, many small. This stunning vascularization of everything means that even inorganic systems can have a kind of life, where life is defined as accommodating currents of flow and change. Living systems are thus flow systems, and if a system is no longer able to deal with currents of flow and change, it dies. We can say the same of human systems. To the extent that a human system can accommodate flow, is the extent to which it will persist in time, that is, to live. In some fundamental sense, this idea, strange and wonderful, is the guiding idea of this work. This framing of living systems as flow systems has everything to do with collapse and renewal. But let me not get ahead of myself. 